I should think, as the man you call Judas, that I should be grateful for an opportunity to speak with my own mind, my own memory, and my own eyes of the events I experienced in my lifetime. And I would like you to know first that I prefer to be called by the Hebrew version of my name, Judah, rather than the name Judas, the Greek version, so commonly accepted even during my lifetime and which I always felt took away something of my Jewishness, even my sense of loyalty to the law and to my purpose. My father, Simon, served in the court of Israel, the great Sanhedrin, and was close with the members of that body, particularly the Pharisees of that body, and particularly some names that you still might recognize, those of Nicodemus, of Gamaliel, of Joseph, of Arimathea, and even of Annas, Caiaphas, and others who play important roles in the story that you know so well of the last year and a half, two years, in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Because of my father's relationship to the Sanhedrin, my own work involved representing, at times, that body, serving sometimes as a courier and perhaps even probably you might have called me a spy for that body because frankly that was the focus of my work during the period when I had encountered the master. I should say that it really began with a very tragic incident in the temple in Jerusalem when it became widely known that Pontius Pilate had used the money from the treasury of the temple for the purpose of building an aqueduct from the sacred pools of Bethlehem to provide water to the fortress to supply his needs in Jerusalem. It was so resented that it outraged all the men of Israel. And yet few men seemed able to display the manhood to challenge this Roman puppet and his treatment of the people of Israel. It was obvious to all of us, perhaps even more to me for some reason, that he held the people of Israel in contempt. It didn't help at all that when one went into the temple to worship, to make sacrifice, 
that one was likely to look upward to the walls of the fortress Antonio, fortress built by Herod the Great, the oppressor of Israel, and yet the builder of this temple. So grand was the temple, and the people of Israel might have been grateful to Herod for the building of it, for its beauty, for its grandeur. Had he not then overshadowed it by a higher structure, the imposing fortress, whose walls were built adjacent to the walls of the temple for the specific purpose of providing a point of vision from which the oppressors could look down upon the activities in the court of the Hebrews. And going to worship, one could look up to those walls and see the soldiers of Rome moving about, looking down upon the people and observing our every move. It didn't make worship easier. And when one might look up, perchance, and see Pontius Pilate himself, it seemed to me there was always a sneer, always a, a countenance that suggested superiority, self-satisfaction. And probably at no time did that incense the men of Israel more than on this day when men of Galilee revolted here in the temple, challenged the authority of Pilate, protested his rule, and were subjected to a bloodbath. Literally hundreds of them were killed within the temple compound. As I entered and walked through the court of the Gentiles, the whole portico was, was littered with the bodies of these brave men. All the more interesting, perhaps, that it happened in Judea, in a country divided, it was not the problem, not the concern of the people of Galilee. It should have been men of Jerusalem, patriotic enough, bold enough to protest themselves, and perhaps more sensibly. But these men of Galilee often held in contempt by the Jews of Jerusalem, were made, it seemed, of stronger stuff than we, and sacrificed themselves to protest this misuse of the funds of the temple. The bodies, the murdered men, were not only in the courts of the Gentiles, but even in the court of the Jews. In the Hebrew court where the signs clearly instructed that no Gentile was to go, the sign was ignored by the soldiers of Rome, who went anywhere they pleased within the temple and thus desecrated this holy place and the last vestige of our independence and our dignity in our own country. So it hurt all the more that these men were slain even in the holy place, the holier part of the temple in the court of Hebrews where some had fled to avoid the swords of the soldiers of Rome. I was in the temple on the day of that massacre, 
because I was summoned by the high priest. I was called there for the purpose of an assignment, an assignment which in reality delighted me. I had spent most of my life hearing the stories of the Messiah and the promise of his coming. As a child, I dreamed dreams of the Messiah, what he would be like, what it would be like to be in his presence. I knew that the prophecies had said that it is during this time that he is due. And certainly there was never a time of greater need for his appearance. How should one have the opportunity to discover just who this Messiah is, should he come? There had been countless men who had called themselves the Messiah, who had appeared year after year to lead revolt after revolt, almost all of them ending in a bloodbath, and the death of the one who had proclaimed himself Messiah. It seemed hopeless to identify this man until in some way he had revealed himself in some way that all of the nation of Israel would know and would recognize him for his countenance, his action, whatever it might be, that might allow us to discover who he was. And yet it was to me a difficult task because in in reading and knowing the prophecies, it was suggested that we would not recognize him, that he would appear and that we would not know him. We had already been warned by the prophets that it would not be easy to discern just who the Messiah is. And what is one to do? It is as if to follow anyone who proclaims himself to be the Messiah is a dangerous and gullible thing. And at the same time, if the prophets had said that seeing him we would not know him, we would not recognize him, were we not then warned not to reject anyone in whom there was the possibility it was a bit like a trap. We were afraid not to follow one who could possibly be the Messiah. And we were afraid to follow everyone who proclaimed himself a Messiah. It seemed that either way we were damned. But the hope didn't die because of that. And on this day, I was given a commission that particularly delighted me because it was a commission from the temple, from the authorities, to investigate those who developed followings and proclaimed themselves to be prophets or the Messiah. Indeed, at this particular time, there was a figure somehow associated with the Essenes of the Jordan, a man who called himself the Baptist, who needed looking at, according to the thought of the priests, and I was being commissioned to go there, to see him, to bring back reports of his activities, to describe the atmosphere and the quality of presence of this man, 
And while there was inherent in the commission an implied duty to to discredit this teacher, this prophet, this Baptist. At the same time, it put me in a position of being there. Should this man really be the Messiah, I would be there in his presence and commissioned to do so with my expenses paid. I had nothing more than contempt for Annas and Caiaphas and little better even for my own teacher, the Pharisee, the Nazi of the Sanhedrin, Gamaliel who was there as well. And while I had no real respect for the men or for their purpose in assigning the commission, yet I delighted in the opportunity. I wanted nothing more than to know and to serve the Messiah. And with this commission, I went then to a place not far from the Essene community of Qumran, just at the northern end of the Dead Sea, where this unusual prophet was teaching, baptizing, and even entertaining the people. He was surrounded on that day by an unusual lot of people, most of them a quality of people that you might consider rogues, ruffians, not the best of company. And I think this was because that John spoke with a very bold voice. We were careful throughout Israel at the time, careful in any criticism of the priests and even of the Romans, careful who was hearing, for there were spies everywhere. One never knew who was listening and what might be the result of a careless word. And yet here this man stood boldly condemning Rome. And just as boldly condemning Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee, and even the chief priests and scribes of Jerusalem. It was obviously true that the temple had lost its sanctity, had been corrupted and defiled. It was so obvious when one went into the temple area and found the teachers seated at the foot of the great pillars in the portico of Solomon. The teachers were no longer the priests of the temple, for the priests had long since given up their commission to teach, to be the keepers, the carriers of the Holy Word, they had given themselves to the practice of politics and law, judgment, and the business of running the temple for money. And now the teaching was done by the scribes. by a whole new class of men, temple functionaries, who had come to be known as the rabbis. 
the teachers. And so here was a rabbi, John, of the sect of the Essenes and yet bolder, very different from the Essene people. Even though they surrounded him and encouraged him, yet they seemed mortified by his words, by his boldness. Not because they were afraid, but because they were so pious. Speaking of peace and of quiet, still they condemned wrong action, but not with the militant tendency that could easily be seen as a deliberate attempt to, to taunt, to stir these powerful people who by their very nature were egomaniacs and to accuse them of such things as John accused them seemed worse than foolhardy. Here he was at the edge of the region of Galilee not far at all from the jurisdiction of Herod. And as I came upon him, I could hear him referring to Herod as a whoremonger and to his wife as a whore. These are not the kind of words that endear one to the ruling class. I was amazed and I was drawn to him. Quite frankly, I was thrilled. Looking back now, of course, I would question why I was thrilled. It certainly wasn't the love in me that was mustered by the boldness of the Baptist and the rougher element in the crowd that gathered that day were the zealots, many of them acquaintances of mine. I had encountered them first in the court of the Hebrews among the rabble and the din, the noise of the marketplace that operates there. always cleverly disguised and seemingly incapable of causing trouble. For the most part, they looked during the day to be beggars, bums, men of no account, usually selling some insignificant wares in the market stalls, nothing better than souvenirs. In the porches of the temple, they didn't appear to be men who cared about the temple or even about Israel. Their disguises were effective. But they rubbed shoulders with the Roman soldiers and even with the priests of the temple, managing to look so harmless by appearing to be greatly under the influence of wine and incapable of living their own lives effectively. No one looks quite so innocuous, non-threatening as a bum, a beggar, one who pleads for alms at the gates of the temple. And it was in such situations that I had encountered Simon, a man who had earned for himself the name Simon Zelot, 
that last name. The last name was given to him because of his effectiveness in battle. After the tradition of Rome, actually, when a man had made himself a hero in battle, such, such a hero, such a war hero, was given of times a last name which indicated his valor. Simon Zealots was the only man I know who had been given such an honor, thus indicating that he was one of the more, more powerful, one of the more committed to the purpose of the zealots. And the zealots, in turn, were those of the people of Israel who lived for and were committed to the purpose of freeing Israel from the domination of Rome. Perhaps nothing else in their minds had such great importance, unless it was their purpose for being so committed, which might have been, in some cases, their commitment to the God of Israel. But very often that purpose was distorted. And their determination to fight a guerrilla war against Rome and depose them and yet no one looked forward more than the zealots to the coming of the Messiah but the Messiah they looked for is a warrior king and I wasn't so sure in my own mind that the Messiah would come as a warrior king after all he was called the Prince of Peace and yet he was described as well by the prophets as one who would lead the people of Israel victorious over their enemies. It was all a bit confusing. It wasn't exactly a pleasant experience to come to know either Simon or and Joshua Bar Abbas. Joshua too was one of these vendors in the temple area who looked so harmless in his guise of one taken with too much wine, an ineffective person. The encounter was one of being jostled by this filthy man who looked so unkempt and whose breath smelled so badly, both of wine and of garlic. Being bumped by such a one is a rude experience in itself. But looking to see who you've been jostled by and encountering a face inches from your own breathing such fumes makes the experience all the more unpleasant. But there was something in his countenance, in his eyes, in his deliberate gaze into mine that let me know there was something more to his purpose than just being a beggar, I suddenly realized this is a man who is here for a purpose, a man in disguise, a spy. But for whom? For the temple, for the high priest, for, for Rome. It could have been any. He knew my name. And I suppose that is not surprising for I came and went frequently in the area of the temple more frequently perhaps than I would have wanted. But it was my business that carried me there. And being of a family of the aristocracy, many who spent their time in this area knew me my name, my purpose, 
my activities, perhaps more than I would have wanted. And so when he called me by name, that was no great surprise. But the determination, the purpose, the focus with which he spoke caught my attention. He didn't say much, only that I should meet him at night in the garden just across the valley, the Garden of Gethsemane, on the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Tombs. I quickly became aware of others about seeing our communication, causing both of us to feel nervous. He jostled me again in an unfriendly kind of way and disappeared. And this was my introduction, really, to the party of zealots who met that night under cover of dark in a building that you might describe as something of a, a tool shed in the area of the cemetery. And in the, in the light of the torches, the candles there, I recognized many faces. Many of them, of the, the beggars, the tramps, the rougher element of the temple area, and yet here they spoke with a clear voice and a clear eye and a clear purpose. They were operating as a clandestine army. I was thrilled to know that such was so well organized that there were so many throughout Israel planning the overthrow of Rome and that there were so many committed and dedicated to it. Even Nicodemus was there. Possibly the wealthiest man in all Israel was there to finance such a venture, but only if it were well organized and well thought out. He was not as yet satisfied with the plans and the organization of the zealots, the guerrilla army, as it was coming together, and headed, apparently, for the most part, by these two men, Simon Zealots and Joshua Barabbas. And now on the banks of the Jordan, I recognized these two men again in any number of, of people of the marketplace, of the lower class, of Jerusalem. They're gathered about John to listen to these words which at once promised salvation, cleansing, a spiritual experience, renewal, transformation new birth and offering the baptism and at the same time condemned the, the enemies of the people from Herod to Pontius Pilate to Rome to the high priesthood. Nothing seemed sacred to him except one's relationship with God in a real and spiritual and personal way. It wasn't hard to believe that the Baptist might be the Messiah, and I wasn't the only one in the crowd who considered that possibility. In fact, there were some who seemed very much to worship him and had made the assumption that he was the Messiah who was to come. I became aware that I wasn't the only one in the crowd for the purpose of questioning this man and reporting back to the priests both Pharisees and Sadducees were here, scribes with their questions and trick questions they were, attempts to trip him up in his teaching to cause him to identify himself as the Messiah, looking for something to accuse him, and yet in answer to the questions he would never describe himself, either as a messiah or even as a prophet. 
he would only admit to being a voice in the wilderness saying build a highway and make it straight for one who comes after me and you could feel in the crowd a sort of disappointment that this one should refer the people to someone else yet to come I mean seeming to announce that this is not the Messiah I mean just when we felt as if we had discovered him it was as if that one we thought was him announced that once again our hopes were dashed and the Messiah was to come later it was a little difficult to understand particularly considering the magic of the man's words and his presence I certainly had never seen one with so great charisma such an ability with words and with his presence to sway the people to inspire us to make us believe maybe it is because we wanted so much to believe and part of it might be that he was saying the things that we wanted to hear things that we ourselves wanted to say and didn't dare not having the power the force the conviction the commitment that this man had real commitment to a cause is a powerful thing and because so few men really believe in what they teach and preach and claim those who do so with real commitment carry within them a power that those who have no commitment are helpless against whatever it was his commitment or more likely the presence of the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit in him and through him we were affected we wanted to believe we felt disappointment our hopes dashed when he spoke of one who was to come after him and he seemed to sense that he knew it it seemed very clear that he knew what we were thinking over and over again he would answer our questions when we just thought them and didn't even ask them because when we began to feel disappointed let down that he spoke of another who was to come he quickly added that he will come before the sun sets tomorrow again our curiosity was piqued our hope was renewed and none of us whether of the shopkeepers or the Galileans or the Essenes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees the scribes from the temple none of us would have missed being there tomorrow for all the gold of Israel not only was he a prophet a seer he knew how to lead men how to manipulate our wills many of those about me were baptized that day many of them about us were obviously his disciples and no one was more disappointed than they that he should proclaim himself not to be the Messiah the leader of all Israel for for whom we had waited so long as we stopped after the sundown and camped about 
the Jordan that night, there were discussions about this unusual man, this prophet, who wore animal skins, whose feet appeared as if they had never known sandals, who had something of a quality of, of a wild man about him, a passionate being and powerful. And somehow this became our, our image, our expectancy for the nature of the man to appear tomorrow. We were looking for someone like the Baptist. We'd seen miracles that day. A child was healed in our presence. People were changed. And some of the miracles were not so much the physical healing as the change in the countenance and the manner, the attitude, the character of those he touched and baptized. I'll never forget the next day when we saw him look up, gazing off into the distance as if he was seeing a vision, and of course we all turned to see what he was looking at, and we saw a man walking across the desert, not bothering to follow the road. A man dressed quite differently, and seemingly more educated, more sophisticated, not in any sense well-dressed, but certainly more conventionally dressed and more conventional in appearance. A striking man, and as I saw him coming, I think there was no doubt in my mind, nor in the minds of any other present, that this was the man about whom John spoke. Even seeing him at a distance, there was a feeling of specialness about him. And that quality is very hard to describe, except that, like almost every man there, I had heard from my earliest memory the prophecies concerning the Messiah, the various descriptions of him, the qualities of the presence and what he would be like. and through my mind was going the description said there is no comeliness about him that we would look upon he was described as not so much a handsome man not that we would desire him or be drawn to him because he was attractive of face or countenance in fact the face itself might be described as rather plain, although powerful. But here's a man who had a quality behind that face, or looking out from those eyes that one had never seen before. Indeed, it was not the comeliness of his face, his appearance, that attracted anyone to him, I think because one could hardly notice the physical characteristics of that face for noticing something that came out of it, something that came out of the eyes, the presence, the way they carried himself. There was something about him, not the physical, not the body, but something about him that was greater than the body. And it was that that one saw. It was because of that that one could hardly see the physical. And if one were asked to describe his physical presence, his face, his size, I should have found it difficult, simply because it was not that that I saw.
the crowd sort of automatically parted and stepped back and, and formed a great wide way through which he could come. Deferring to him as if by magic or some force of of honor, of recognition, of deference. He walked straight into the water, the river, his eyes looking directly into the eyes of John, the baptizer. And John looking at him, they embraced one another. There's a look of recognition and in a brief conversation which indicated that while they recognized one another, it was not because of being together, not because of growing together. Indeed, they might never have seen one another physically before. And yet so much were they aware, one another and, and the work. Rumor had it that they had been educated, both of them, together, in Egypt, in the schools of initiation there. But neither talked of those days. And as they embraced, John confirmed to those of us about that indeed this is the one he had spoken of, spoke of him as the Lamb of God, and said to him that he recognized him because he saw a dove descending from heaven and lighting upon him because he heard a voice of heaven indicating that this one was the son and so he baptized him there in our presence the master then sat and began to teach And so many of those who had been disciples of John until that day seemed more attracted to him, more inclined to follow this one, and it seemed natural that it would be so. Almost as if John had yielded authority to him, almost as if he had transferred the loyalty and the expectancy of his disciples, his followers, to this other one, this master, this greater teacher. We listened to his message and it was so different. Whereas John sounded like a militant leader, one who might lead an army against Rome, here was a a more gentle man, but one with a sense of humor and power, but the power was different, and the direction seemed different. He didn't speak against Rome, against the priests, against Herod. He spoke instead of, a, of another kingdom. He seemed to speak of spiritual qualities. And once more, the zealots were disappointed. They came looking for a warrior and found a man speaking of peace. It was not until we saw his miracles, the healing of a blind man there, that we began to think again. A man of so much power and a man who spoke of liberating the people and of a time when the kingdom of Israel would ascend to bring peace to all the world and have a kingdom that would that would be so great that the knees of Rome would bow before it And the hopes were generated again. For myself, I had no doubt 
this was the Messiah. I could not have denied it. I'm not even sure for me that it was a, a rational decision. But I did know that for me there was no choice. I recognized him. I wanted to serve him, to follow him, to give him my life. I would die for him. So great was my feeling for this man I'd only just met and just encountered. I would never have believed that it could be so. But it was. I would like to point out to you that I would not attempt to justify my actions in my relationship with the Master. Indeed, I'd like to call your attention to the attitude, the manner in which I approached this event which to me all my life had been a sacred hope. I would have given my life to know the Master, and that is true. At the same time, I was not wise enough to recognize that the very purpose for my being there, the manner in which I found my way to him was in itself dishonest. In my self-righteousness, I condemned the priests. I judged the common folk and the rabble-rousers, and particularly the Galileans that I found around the Messiah. I thought of them, I suppose as most did, of being slow of mind. And certainly less sophisticated, less educated than myself and less worthy of being servants to the Master. Indeed, I suppose I even allowed myself to think that he surrounded himself with these men, the fishermen of Galilee, because he felt comfortable with them, having grown up among them, and yet he didn't speak like them, nor act like one of these boorish, uneducated Galileans. On that first day at the Jordan, when the Messiah went his way, leaving the rest of us around the campfires for the night, he took with him only two followers. I was aware that one could only become a disciple of such a teacher, such a master, upon invitation. One could follow him as I fully intended to, whether he invited me or not. That I knew, that decision in my mind was already made, but he didn't turn to me and offer the opportunity to follow. He turned only to Andrew. And the other, 
that he chose, I understood even less. For Andrew was a rather commanding, but somewhat servile presence. A bit more educated, authoritative, in charge, intelligent. But the other, who I understood to be his brother, Simon, struck me as being, well, someone I instantly disliked. So simple-minded. even irresponsible in following the master, not knowing who the master was, not having the, the, the presence of mind, the intelligence to even understand the implications of who he followed, and yet the master turned to him and, and invited him to follow. And these were the first two. They disappeared for that day, and we were left to talk about ourselves with the disciples of the Baptist, and even to discuss somewhat the events of the day with the Baptist himself, although he entertained very little conversation except to tell us that he was off then, his work being finished. He, in effect, said, I'm through with my mission, my ministry, except that I have one more task to go into Judea. And into the regions of Galilee for this one last time. He spoke as if he were speaking of his own death, the ending of his ministry. He was a young man, some ten years older than myself, perhaps, but not of an age to retire or to be thinking of death. But it was obvious he knew things that we didn't know. It was also obvious that one speaking as he spoke was certainly taking his life into his own hands to go deliberately into Galilee, into Herod's own environs. It seemed unwise, to say the least. And on the following day, What I saw, I suppose, on that day convinced me, even beyond what I had seen before, of the presence of, of something far greater than I had even dreamed that the Messiah would be. When I saw a leper, I wish even I could describe that to you, coming into the crowd, and we instinctively, I suppose, drew back. I mean, it was something that doesn't happen. Lepers didn't come into the city. They didn't come into crowds of people. They knew their place. They were unclean by law, not allowed to approach a group of people and his coming into our midst was, was something that I thought of as, as irresponsibly endangering our lives, exposing us to the horror of what he experienced. I was offended and clearly so were the others except the Master, the Messiah, was inviting him. And even approached him, met him, touched him. I was revolted. 
and so was everyone. It's beyond description. When you see scabs, sores, literally fall from a body to the ground, And that body change its appearance when you see it happening. And it's more than seeing. There's an energy. There's something not describable, transferred from the master to the one he touched, and there was even a sense of something going out of him, a, a sense of giving up a part of himself, something draining from his vitality. And something that happens to the one touched, the one healed, that goes beyond the change on the surface of the skin, it is as if you see someone come from one extreme, a revolting, horrible extreme, to, in a sense, pass yourself, meaning that he took on a quality very much like the Master himself in, in the way that he radiated, the way that he glowed. After the experience, it was more than a healing of the physical body. It was a change in the quality of the being, and, and one could see it in his eyes, in his presence, in his face. He became more than healed. And somehow that quality impressed me, certainly, and I think others, more than the physical healing. I wish I could tell you what it felt like to have him look directly into your eyes as he did mine and called me by name. He couldn't have known me. I'd never encountered him before. But then I'd seen that happen to a dozen others. So I almost expected it. But I didn't anticipate what it felt like to have him look into me. When he suggested that I should meet him in Cana of Galilee, in two days' time. I knew that I was not asked to follow him, to be a disciple. And yet he showed an interest in me, and he responded in the same way to Simon, to Simon Zealot, who was there, the two of us. I wouldn't not have gone for anything. I wanted to be his follower, his disciple, and I really didn't even realize at the moment that he was more aware than I of my own uncleanness, my lack of honesty, my lack of integrity even in my manner of being there, in my purpose. He knew I'd come there as a spy. And I didn't care that he knew that. It seemed to me that one didn't owe honor, or even honesty, to men of such vile repute as the priests, who I found disgusting having distorted the very purpose of the temple and, and having no commitment that I could see 
to the God of Israel. Not just from my point of view as a Pharisee, looking upon Sadducees whose beliefs obviously were different from my own, but more importantly, these men had no convictions of their own, their religion. Quite obviously, something of a joke. An excuse to wield power and to conspire with the Romans. I felt no guilt at being dishonest in my relationship with them, accepting their money, their commission, accepting their support in pursuing what I wanted most to pursue with my life. I'd always wanted to find and to follow the Messiah. And if they made it possible, even for their own foolish, dishonest purposes, I was willing to participate in that. I cannot explain to you why I thought so irresponsibly, but perhaps it may serve you to look upon your own motivations, your own relationships, your own purpose, and your approach to the Master. Would you have justified similar action? And in doing so, attempt to build a spiritual life on a corrupt foundation. Had you asked me that, of course, I would have been horrified that you would suggest that I would do such a thing. I'm quite clear that few of us know the dishonesty in our own hearts. I felt more acceptable, more deserving than those he called. I felt quite righteous. I felt certain that my motivation was pure, that my desire to follow and to serve him was beyond reproach. And this little incident with the, with the priests My very purpose, assigned task, to betray the man. If he were the Messiah, I knew that was the purpose of my commission from the beginning. It was not my intention. It was my assignment. I knew that, and I knew that I didn't intend to do so, I would have given my own life first. But he knew. I know that he knew, and somehow I even sensed it then. And yet, because I thought that it didn't matter, it seemed unimportant to me that he knew. I rather assumed, I suppose, that he would find it of no more importance than I. It was necessary that I report back to the temple on the following day. I evaded their questions, although I realized that in the crowd, along with me, there were scribes, there were spies, both Pharisee and Sadducee, who were sent to observe him just as I. The powerful elite of the temple were never ill-informed of the actions and whereabouts of the Master. They had eyes and ears. They knew every move. And so I knew that I could not report to them an untruth I held them in such contempt, and they knew that. 
They trusted me no more than I trusted them. And I thought it would be no difficulty avoiding their questions and and avoiding their discovering my sympathies for this man. I had no intention of revealing him as the real Messiah before them. And yet as they questioned me of the events of the day before, I found myself defending him, assuring them that he made no claim to be the Messiah, and he didn't. He never said that. He did speak of his father, and yet he allowed us to realize that that he spoke of our father, He even said as much. It took the priest very little time to recognize where my sympathies lay. They identified me as a follower of this man, though I denied it. I didn't reveal it in my words. Certainly they saw it in my sympathies. Thus I had lost the trust of the priest who had commissioned me, and at the same time I had a commitment to them, a commission, which I intended to maintain for my own purposes. Not that I was lacking means to travel independently, I had a comfortable inheritance, a home in Jerusalem, land in my ancestral community of Kerioth. But it was convenient to allow the temple to support me in my investigation of the Messiah, in my opportunity to study, to learn, And it seemed foolish to cast aside such an opportunity. I didn't mind reporting from time to time on the activities, the whereabouts, the developments of this Messiah, though I had no intention of endangering him. On that next day in Cana, we found ourselves invited to a wedding. It was in the home of one of the wealthier men of Cana. A rather palatial estate, particularly for this backward country. Indeed, the banquet laid out might have been such as one might expect in Jerusalem or the better parts of the world, even in a Roman household, Greek. There was certainly no lack of refreshments or expense. And yet, the reputation of the Master had preceded him already It was known throughout Israel that here was a man from Nazareth healing, working miracles. People came from far and wide to see him, and here was a wedding to to which perhaps 50, 75 people had been invited, and 200 or more were present, not so much for, for the wedding, to see the master. It even seemed a bit strange that the bride and groom received so little attention as the crowd gathered around Jesus. 
who sat telling stories, teaching, conversing with the people, and seemingly enjoying himself. And it was because of his presence that the wine that had been ordered for the feast was gone even before the ceremony. When traditionally it isn't even opened until afterward, yet so many had come from so far, it seemed only right to offer refreshment. And then the host was embarrassed. It was then that I first saw his mother. She looked more like his sister. Not an old woman, attractive quiet, kindly, and a woman who, who felt very much in charge. She approached him through the crowd and simply said to him, quietly, so as, I suppose, not to embarrass the host, yet those of us gathered closely around the uh, followers, the Disciples already appointed now were six. They included a young man sometimes called Bartholomew. Very animated excited kind of fellow and a scholar called Nathaniel. Philip and Nathaniel friends. And there was James and John, young men. And these six with Andrew appearing to be in charge as if a secretary, a manager, a manager of his affairs, they gathered about him, they prevented people touching him, watched over him almost as if he were helpless, something he didn't seem to need. But it gave them a sense of importance and something to do, perhaps, to identify themselves with him. But Andrew was very much in charge and let Miriam through the crowd to the master, and she whispered, they have run out of wine. He seemed immediately aware that it was because of his presence and the guests drawn because of his presence that the that the wine was gone, and yet I heard him say to her, what has this to do with me? My work has not yet begun. She paid little attention to what he'd said and only turned to call the servants of the house and said to them, Whatever he tells you to do, do it. In the wedding custom, there are large stone jars used for the purpose of purifying the couple, um, something of a baptism, a ritual. There were several of these holding several gallons each, that were brought to him, filled with water, 
he touched them and he may have said something, some blessing, likely. The startling result was that there was a sparkling red wine, deep red, that was poured, dipped from these jars. I'd already heard the stories of of the master standing on the banks of the Galilee and and showing the fishermen, Peter and James and John and Andrew, to cast their nets in a particular place to catch fish. I allowed myself to be amused that these fishermen were calling, following the master because he helped them with their fishing. It rather convinced me that they had little insight into his purpose or who he was, a magical fisherman. And then there was Nathaniel who was so impressed that that Jesus had seen him in a vision before he came and had described what he was doing, the, the clairvoyance it seemed to be the purpose of this scholar, even a wealthy man, making the decision to follow the master. I had scoffed at these little feats of, of magic as reasons to become disciples, and yet here in this moment seeing water become wine, not just red, but sparkling wine, bubbling. It's difficult to describe what one feels seeing such a thing, but I was all the more convinced of the power and purpose of the man. There is so much more to describe, and perhaps most important is the incident of the man blind from birth who approached the master on the Sabbath and said to him, I have not seen from birth, I have not had the experience of seeing a flower, a woman, even the light of the sun. He said to the master, I cannot even imagine what seeing is like. And the master asked him, Why do you approach me with your tale of woe? And the man said to him, Because in all of Israel only you can give me sight. And Jesus asked him, Do you really believe? You really believe that you can be given sight, having been born blind? I was amused when the man answered, Rabbi, Master, I not only believe, I know I can. The very strength of his conviction, his sense of expectancy, his absolute assurance, that it could and would happen, astounded me. The quality of belief made me ashamed. And it was in response to this that the Master said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Without hesitation he went and washed, and it was only minutes later that he returned his eyes wide as if he couldn't take in enough of what he now saw, as if he was trying to take in everything at once, trying to amplify, as it were, the sense of sight. 
and a, an astonished look on his face from his eyes so wide, and a sense of delight like a child, as if the commonest things that we saw were yet another miracle to him. And it was that week that we learned that Jesus was to be tried before the Sanhedrin. I learned it quite by accident as I reported to the authorities, to the priests. I heard the arrangements being made. It was something of a secret. And immediately I approached Gamaliel for the permission to attend the hearing, to be there. I was scared. I was frightened for what they might do or attempt to do to the Messiah. Certainly they had they'd put others to death before for no more than he might be accused of. The accusation this time was of violating the Sabbath. It wasn't difficult to gain permission to sit at the hearing, to observe. I only needed the signed pass from Gamaliel in his position as president, as it were, of the court, the leader of the opposition, as he might be described, in that Annas, Caiaphas, represented the office of high priest and as such was the prosecutor of the court, presented, controlled the case, yet Gamaliel had the right to question the proceedings to control the balance of fairness of the proceedings. And so I sat wondering. It would require two witnesses to condemn him. Who would the witnesses be? Who would speak against him? Certainly not the man healed and the others present were, were those of us who were his followers. I wondered, and as I took my place and waited, at first were called the man himself, the man who had been healed. Now with his sight, obviously, and his parents, his father, his mother, though I didn't know who they were at the time, entered with him and sat at the table with the prosecutor as the proceedings began. He was called first. And questioning him, the, the prosecutor, Caiaphas, looked to my thinking something of a fool in his attempt to use this man so impressed with the Messiah, with the Master, so impressed with his experience of healing, to attempt to use this man to condemn. The Master seemed, even on the surface, a bit foolish, but he asked the man what occurred. And he spoke of being blind from birth, having been healed at the waters of Siloam, Yes, he had been there many times before. He had washed in the waters before. No, he had never seen a healing occur there, but he knew by reputation that they occurred just from word of mouth. Did the Master call himself the Messiah? Did he claim to be the Son of God? And the man responded, No, I've heard none of that. I know nothing of these things. 
Did you not call him the Son of God when you approached him? I did, he said. And why? And he responded, because I believe that he is. And Caiaphas responded, then, then he claims to be the Son of God himself. And the man responded, though a peasant, though untutored, and though obviously frightened and confused, still he responded with something of confidence and said, those are my words, not his. He was asked, were you unaware that you were breaking the Sabbath? That you were participating in breaking the law, causing this man to work on the Sabbath and, and you participating with him? And he apologized. I never thought of that. But then he said, is not this the sacred work of the Sabbath? It's not this that the Sabbath is created for. The accusations continued until finally the man stood and said, Sir, I know nothing of these things. I only know that whereas I was blind, now I see. The members of the court erupted into applause. They seemed disinclined to condemn the man Jesus at this point. And then a second witness was called and I was alarmed, for it was Simon Zealots. Now one of the apostles, a follower of his, taking the stand and while he was on the stand speaking of Jesus as the Messiah the Son of God yes he healed the man yes he performed miracles I have seen him I have heard him called God the Son of God and he does not deny it and all the things that Simon said were attempts to be supportive he didn't attempt to condemn in any way. He seemed even in his intent to be praising the Messiah. Yet I sat there thinking, you fool, to reveal him, to put him in a position of having to defend himself, to be in the position of being accused of blasphemy. Why would you do it? I couldn't speak out. There was nothing that I could do. The proceedings were interrupted. And suddenly, suddenly it seemed that all the authorities, Gamaliel, Annas, Caiaphas, suddenly were backing off, suddenly were eager to end the proceedings without any judgment. Obviously, we wondered what had happened, what message the courier had brought that could have changed their determination to so destroy the master. But so it was that the proceedings ended without judgment. Jesus never appeared, was never directly accused, did not participate in the hearings. Indeed, we, we didn't know where he was at that moment, but we did become aware of a clamor outside and as the proceedings ended, there was a rush, first of the authorities and of the rest of us, to see what might be happening out in the courts of the temple. You can't imagine the scene. It was like a great parade. People were waving palm branches. 
And there he was, Jesus, riding on a donkey. The palm branches in his path, being hailed as king of Israel in the temple itself. There was a kind of mixed emotion for me, a kind of, of, of delight. It's what should happen on the one hand and a horror on the other. It was as if he were being set up for execution. Nothing worse could happen. I even looked up to the walls of the fortress Antonio and saw Pilate looking down on this parade of joyous people welcoming the Messiah into Jerusalem. And now it had happened publicly. Publicly, crowds of people proclaiming him to be the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and in the presence of the high priest. And under the eyes of Pilate, He didn't seem worried. He seemed as happy as, as a child to be a part of the parade, waving, laughing at the people, participating in the whole affair, as if it is just what he wanted. Somehow it looked at once the most joyous spectacle I had ever seen, at the, at the same time quite ridiculous. How does one look like a Messiah, a king of Israel, a grown man on the back of a donkey? And yet even the absurdity seemed like a, a statement from this man who was so confident, so powerful, that he didn't mind being seen like a little child in such a position. In some ways it was more amazing than the miracles. It was just two days later that the Master and I, I suppose because we, only the two of us, were men of Judea among the apostles, the two of us were invited to dinner in the home of an important man of the temple, the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee. As we were being entertained in his palatial home, certainly the master was more aware than I that the man's intentions were not good. I felt uncomfortable. I could recognize the whole affair as, as designed to, to make him reveal himself, to, to gather evidence against him. How could a man so wise so powerful such ability to know and see, how could such a man seem so naive, so childlike, make himself so available to be used, to be taken advantage of? It encouraged all of us to look after him as if he were helpless. Indeed, Simon Peter had become something of a, a butler, a valet rushed here and there to to get his clothes to 
fetch his sandals to wash to wipe his feet he seemed so helpless at times so unknowing I was fully aware that he was being insulted in the house of this man and as I was thinking wondering how to protect him I became aware to my horror of a very scantily clad woman dancing suggestively making her way into the room a belly dancer of sorts as if prearranged to entertain the master with such things I hardly could be a greater insult to a rabbi she came to dance before him and and knelt down undulating at his feet I was incensed I demanded to know why she was there as if I didn't know that it were arranged by our host and you know he held me back I would have gotten him out of, of the situation away from there but he stopped me and uh, and allowed this spectacle to continue and it, it somehow her manner suddenly changed as she stopped looked up at him and and said I've heard you teach I've been drawn to what you say and her question sort of implied is there any hope for me the master reached out and touched her it seemed to me the worst that he could have done seeing that the whole arrangement was to embarrass him how could he so play into their hands she opened an alabaster box and poured ointment on his feet and rubbed them and our our host then who obviously had arranged the whole thing hypocritically began to accuse him what what are you doing in the company of such women and is this the way you live and the master smiled and reminded him I'm a guest in your house you have not as is the custom washed my feet she anoints them with oil and ointment does she not more honor to a guest in your house than you it seemed rather obvious that what was designed to be a, a slight to the master which we both of course had noticed we hadn't been received as honored guests the amenities had been ignored as if we didn't matter and now the man's attempt to insult was turning back into his face she was crying the woman holding on to his feet his ankles and suddenly she used her tears to wash his feet she asked him whether she might follow him 
be with him. He said to her that we shall meet again. He even said to her that her name should be remembered throughout time for her quality of commitment to his work. She seemed disappointed. She had not been accepted as a follower, a part of his trusted ones. Certainly the attempt had turned back on one who would have entrapped the master and became his own edification as a spiritual teacher, as a rabbi. The incident became even more interesting when we came upon a crowd of people yelling the, the horror of it became obvious when we saw the same woman against a wall, people throwing stones, accusing her, and suddenly he ran between them. Stones had, had struck her, she bled, appeared even unconscious, and the stones struck him. As he deliberately stepped into the path, I thought he would be killed. As he protected her, the, the mob stopped. And he suggested to the crowd that those without sin should cast the first stone. He was accused by Pharisees in the group of, of protecting sinners and of making himself above the law and of teaching that we should not uphold or keep the law. He stooped down to write in the sand. And while he was writing, he, he addressed our right to enforce the law. Shall one who is guilty of the law enforce the law? He demanded to know of the crowd who among them had themselves slept with her. And there was silence, and, and he asked them, Where is the man she was with? Why are they not both being stoned? And pointed out that only one who is not guilty can enforce a law against one who is. They began to realize that he was all the more dangerous because he made sense. Again and again I was called to report to the chief priests on the activities of the master and as God is my witness in every instance I sought to protect him not to betray him but in that last instance it was It was Nicodemus who had suggested to me that I allow myself to be one of two witnesses, that there might be a trial. The idea was proposed even before Gamaliel 
that for his own sake it would be best that there should be a trial. I was horrified. I, I would not take the witness stand against the master. They assured me that for a capital trial there must be two witnesses. And if I should be willing to be one of these, my credibility as, as a witness and in the employ of the temple and with the aristocracy, the credibility of my family, I might well be able to save his life. I was asked to function for the temple, for the people, to state in public as a witness that yes, he's the Messiah. I was torn. Certainly a part of me wanted to stand and, and, and shout it before everyone on the, from the roost hops that he was the Messiah. I had no hesitation to witness to that and it's that I was being asked to do. And I was assured that it would be nothing more that as a witness I would facilitate the delivery of the the warrant, the orders for arrest and as one of two witnesses that I would speak for the court in effect against him for the prosecution but yet only to say from my observation of what he has done, I know him to be the Messiah. I would not testify to anything else. As to the 30 pieces of silver, they have so often been spoken of as, as if this were a payment to me to betray him and it was not. It was a matter of law in Israel that if I in such a role refused to receive the 30 pieces of silver that it discredited me as a witness. It was required of every witness it was the practice of law. It was the law of Israel. Accepting the 30 pieces was part of the contract, a common practice. It's written as if I was the only one who, who ever related with the court in that way. But it's true that every witness in such a position as I to deliver the warrant and refuse the money was to negate my action to be dishonest. I had to refuse one or the other. I became convinced that it was the right time and the right conditions that he should be delivered up for trial to save his life. I was assured there was Gamaliel, there was Joseph of Arimathea, there was Nicodemus. There were others, many others, 
how the Sanhedrin committed to to him, to his protection. I was assured that he could not be convicted and that having been tried and released, he could never be tried again on those charges. I thought it was to save him. And by now I knew that he knew of my relationship, my commission, my contract with the temple. He had even referred to it and it was that night when we were at dinner together that he said to me, what you have to do, do quickly. It was as if he were telling me I was doing the right thing. I seemed to be hearing that he agreed. No matter that he referred to it as a betrayal, in a sense I could see that it was. At the same time, he seemed to be assuring me that it's what I was for, my purpose. I certainly didn't feel I had a choice. It was not until at the arrest, I mean already as they took him to the house of Caiaphas, and I saw that the trial began there, not even in the court, that he was already condemned. As they drug him before Pilate, and he was made a pawn in a game by the soldiers, we could see it. He was beaten for no reason. He had not even been tried and he was beaten. I saw him bleeding. I saw Peter and I saw John. I saw what was happening and I knew. I was betrayed. I do not seek sympathy, nor even to be excused. Not even that you should understand my action. I do not suggest that history has reported the events incorrectly. I could not suggest that I felt anything other than guilt and remorse. I said I would die for him. The only way I could now was to take my own life. Somehow I fancied even that I did for him. No reason behind that, no, not that I could interpret that as 
doing anything for him. But how could I have so thrown away an opportunity to be his apostle, to serve him in his opportunity to change the world? If there is anything beautiful about my story, what I could tell you about his life and mine, the beauty comes only after death. When he came to me in that miserable place of remorse and punishment that I put myself in after the body. When he came to me and forgave me and took me to be with him and assured me that what I had done in serving him, had served him. Nor was my sin any greater than those who served him less by doing nothing. And yet that, not because any intent of mine was good, but because he is capable of using my most miserable mistake for his divine purpose. There is no greater understanding of transformation, of transmutation, than that. In all of history, perhaps the darkest name of any man that ever lived was Judas Iscariot, the Greek version of my name, by which I was always called, even to now. The miracle of miracles is that the Christ manifest the ability to take that dark name, that dark life of the traitor, the betrayer, and to make of my life a gift which allowed him to become king, not only of the Jews, but of the universe. And for that I'm grateful.